Come on, give him praise. Come on, bless his name. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be worshipped. He's worthy to be honored. Blessings and honor be to you. Glory and power. Dominion and all authority be unto you, Lord. You're great in all of your ways, Lord God. Father, we ask you that you would fill this place continually with your presence, Lord. We thank you for being who you are. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We give you praise, honor, and glory for being God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. We thank the Lord for all those that have been, uh, been sent here by God, you know, to help us to do what we do here. Um, there is no way that we could do what we do without you. Did anybody just hear what I said? There is no way that we could do what we do without you. I want to read a scripture, and um, I'm not. this is not what I'm preaching, but I want to read this scripture to you. And it comes out of Jeremiah 23. It says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, said the Lord. Therefore... Thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have, scattered my, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries, whether I have driven them and will bring them again to their foes, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed neither shall they be lacking say it the lord now one of the reasons that i read that scripture to you today is that you know you have positioned yourself you have positioned yourself to receive the word of god whether i'm your pastor or not it doesn't matter you position yourself to receive the word of god Everybody that's sharing from this book has not been commissioned by God. And everybody that's sharing from this book is not communicating to the people what God say. All right? I can tell you with a surety that this is a pulpit. This is a platform that God has given me to communicate his word to all those that hear and that their life shall be changed and impact for eternity. All right. I know, I know that that many people in the and I, I, I have to say this. I know there are many people that are in the body of Christ that they're, they're self-made Christians. They're self-made. They're self-elevated. They're self-everything. They're, they're self-acclaimed. They're self-affirmed. All self. All right. The Bible, God has put a system in place. All right. And that system in a local assembly is for a pastor or a set individual to communicate to God's people to help them to increase. To help them to increase. All right? Pastor Regas don't know everything. But what I do know, I am sure that I know what I'm communicating to you. Amen. All right. Saying that to say this, if you want to be blessed, if you want to be blessed, those that God has placed in your life, I'm not just saying me, those that God has placed in your life, open up your heart and allow the Spirit of God to use them as the conduit to help you elevate. Am I, am I communicating that clear enough? M many of us, we're not elevating, we're not progressing, we're not being promoted. It's because we've not submitted to authority. There is a chain of blessing. That there is a spirit of the bastard in the earth. I am not a bastard. You are not a bastard. We are children of the Most High God. That's what the Bible tells us. We are children of the Most High God. We're not illegitimate seed. And so being that I'm not illegitimate, my daddy is going to speak to me and speak to you by his spirit. I am, I, I am not an orphan. I have been adopted into the family. Guys, are you hearing me? I'm in the family. The bloodline is flowing upon me. The bloodline is flowing upon you. I am in the family. So I have an inheritance that's due me, and God want to release that upon you. Are you hearing me in this place today, guys? 
If your life is being hindered, there is something that is hindering your life. Your job is to find out what it is. Amen. So this is going to be, you going to be with me today? I'm going in anyway. It doesn't matter. I'm going in anyway. You can sleep. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm going in anyway. It doesn't matter. My job is to communicate the word of heaven. Amen? Amen. And if you believe, receive that which God is speaking to you, if you believe. Hallelujah. Let's go to the book of Exodus. Let's go to the book of Exodus. And we're going to begin here. Um, so you can already have it marked in your Bible. We're going to begin at Exodus. Well, you can go to Exodus 30, verse 17. That's not where we're going to begin. We're going to pick back up um, on the altar here for a minute. You are sure to be blessed today. You are sure to be blessed today. If you're not blessed today, it's not my fault. That means that you need to check your soil. You need to check your soil. You walk in here and say, that was a bad message. It need to be bad for as a category of awesome. Because there, there, there is no, and I'm, I'm not being proud when I say this, there is no reason that anybody that is subject to the Joshua Center and the message that's go for, for you to be spiritually impoverished. If you spiritually published, it's your fault. There's enough revelation flowing up in here to where to, you, you, you'll, you'll go into spiritual obesity. We have to try to back up and not give you too much and try to help you get some understanding. You know, the problem is, is we don't eat what's put before us. And many of us, we eating at all these fast food spiritual joints, and we got parasites growing on the inside of us and don't know that it's going to destroy you in the future. We need some good homegrown food here. It's some good spiritual organic soil here. This ain't no fly-by-night internet punch of butt message. This is, we pray for this. And I'm not saying that it's not great stuff on the internet because it is. You know, the problem is in the church is that we catch wind of slogan, but we have no foundation of what's being said, and we run with slogan, and slogan won't keep you in the day of adversity. A cliche will not keep you in the day of adversity. You need a sound foundation. You know, hype chance won't keep you in the day of adversity. You know, you need to be, the Bible say, be rooted. Be rooted. I'm going to give you the word. Be rooted and grounded in the word. We are a word church. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, a couple of amens today will be great, but if you know, if, if, if it's going to be that type of way, I'm blessed, I'm dressed in black. The man in black today. I am not black, but I'm dressed in black. I am a mocha brother in black today. So that means that I'm in the death zone today. Die to flesh. It ain't, it ain't going to matter. It, it just ain't going to tell you it's a different day today because it's time for us to grow up, man. It's time for us to grow up. It's amazing how we can pass judgment on everybody else in their immaturity, and we immature just as much as they are. We may not be acting the way they act in some areas, but we just as immature as other people are. You know, and so we got to deal with our immaturity. We got to deal with our deficiencies and ask God to help us. Hallelujah. This place, the DNA of this place is a distribution center. We are distrib we, we raising up preachers and leaders. That's what we're doing. You know, so the type of words you get, I told you on Thursday night, you're not going to get bump into wall cotton messages here. This is not the cotton room. I, I do not work for swab. Just telling you the truth. You know, I mean, you're going to get some hard words here. You know, you're going to get some hard words because we're raising up a mighty army. You're not going to go to boot camp, the Marines or the Army. And they say, come on in, brother. Come on in, sister. You know, run that mile. Run that <laughs> whatever. You know, I mean, you come on, come on, guys. Hear what I'm saying here. I mean, God is raising up the last day Army. And we don't have time for cupcakes, sandwich, cheesy, Twinkie messages. That's, the, that's not the type of delicacy that's coming here. I mean, because guess what? We have a real adversary, and we have real issues, and we need God to deliver us right now. I mean, what if the church would come alive right now in America? What if the body of Christ will, will get out of its place of offense and division and stand up and begin to call the shots? Where are the Nathans right now? 
Where are they? Where are the Samuels of our day? We pass judgment on everything. But where are we all in the cave of Adullam? Are we all hiding out? The Bible says that we, we can walk with the spirit of Elijah. Elijah was a prophetic voice in the land. And Elijah dealt with governmental issues because Jezzy and Ahab was governmental. We need that anointing. The Bible says that the spirit of Elijah shall be upon the earth in the last day. That's the spirit that would take a sword. All right. Tabernacle. You have to believe. All right? I'm not imposing my thinking on you. This is God's word. You and I have to believe that everything in life, there is a blueprint. Everything. How do you think you and I got here? Adam and Eve. How do you think they gave birth to their first set? There's a blueprint. We follow the pattern. Everything in life, there is a blueprint. Jesus Christ came to the earth. Christ showed us, by the grace of our Heavenly Father, the pathway back to Eden. That's what happens. We get saved and we go backwards. We try to go forward without going backwards. We have to go back. And so God is showing us right now that, you know, y'all ain't really experienced the glory the way you thought. Y'all ain't really been in the presence the way that you thought. There's greater there's greater. Amen. So the tabernacle is, is, is the pathway into the presence of God. The tabernacle is the pathway into the presence of God. Last week, we dealt with the altar. All right? We dealt with the altar. Can I get a picture of the tabernacle on, on the uh, screen, please? We dealt with the brazen altar last week. And we're going to conclude with the altar here today. But I just want to give you a recap, just a quick recap. Not a 30-minute recap. The brazen altar. We're going to get it today? Huh? Oh, they re-upload? Okay. Thank you. All right. So while he's re-uploading, he's not the computer. It's the computer's fault. He's just the person that's loading. Listen. The brazen altar what, what was, was, was a piece of furniture or, or an instrument that was located right after the gate, the entryway. For you that was here last week, we had the gate. The gate represents who? It's a question. The gate of the tabernacle represents who? It represents Jesus, right? Remember the Bible tells us that there is only one way and Jesus is that way. All right, we went through those scriptures that Christ is the only way. There are many ways that God can use to bring you to the door, but in order to get into the kingdom, you got to come through Jesus. All right? So the tabernacle represented Christ in his four offices. The, the gate represented uh, the four offices of Christ. What does the white represent or the linen represent? You should have been praying and fasting over this the whole week. What does the linen represent? Perfection? That's a good guess. It represent it represented perfection, but it represented the perfect man. The perfect man. What did the blue represent? Wow, we remember that one. The blue represented the word. Because Christ is what? Christ is the word that what? Became flesh. All right? The purple, what does the purple represent? The purple represent royalty. Where do we read in the scripture that Jesus wore purple? When he was on the cross? All right, because somebody said on the cross. No, he wasn't on the cross. He, 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 who gave the garment to him? The guards gave him a purple garment. Purple represent royalty. So now we, and they, they roll dice. They cast lots for his garment because they, they gave it to him and then they tore it off of him, you know. But anyway, the, the purple represents royalty. It represents Jesus Christ as king, all right? And the gold. What does gold represent? Gold, divinity, deity. Remember the calf, the golden calf, 
Remember they took the women's earrings and they put together a calf when Moses stayed gone too long? And so now we see Christ, our Savior, our Messiah, our Redeemer, our King, our great high priest, the Word that became flesh. We see him as God in the flesh. And now once we get Jesus Christ, we can come in to the progression of his presence. We can come in. The Bible says in, in John chapter 10, it, say, it says that the enemy come to kill, steal, and destroy. All right? Because he's come to destroy us. How are we destroyed? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Where is that found in the Bible? Hosea. Hosea what? 4 6. All right, guys. We are a word church. All right? I'm going to preach the way you want to preach in a minute. But, but, but what good is it for us to go Sunday to Sunday and it ain't landing? I mean, we're just going over information and it doesn't land. Oh, that was a good word. And Wednesday, we don't remember anything. So what was the benefit of it being good to you? It wasn't any benefit. This is not flesh about flesh gratification. It's about spiritually elevation. Because the Word of God has the ability to cut you, but it heals you as it cuts you. Amen. So, so the reason we're going through this is because we got to understand is that we can't get in but through Jesus. All right? Paul told the church at Corinth, he says that uh, uh, the God of this world, who's the God of this world? All right? Many, a lot of believers don't even know that. They think God is the God of this world. The, the little G of this world is Satan. All right? Satan, whatever you want to call him. Lucifer, Beelzebub, whatever you want to call him. All right? He's the God of this world. He's the prince and the power of the, the air. So the news media is not your friend. All right. Okay. All right. So, so, so the reason I'm saying that, he says that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of our understanding so that we don't see the revelation that's behind Jesus. And many people don't see it's because they don't get Jesus first. You have to see Jesus first to get into the family. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter what? John chapter 3, church. John chapter 3, stone cold. 3.16. For all you WDFF people, that just remember. John, cha John chapter 3, verse 16. All right, for God so loved the world. But that whole chapter 3 is about Jesus and Nicodemus and salvation. Guys, you got to get this on your mental Rolodex. Or right, we're not here to just pass the time away. This is for real. John 3, 16. It tells us clearly in John 3, 16, Jesus say, Nicodemus, if you're going to get this, you got to be born again. All right? You cannot see or you cannot enter the kingdom except the man be born again. So the tabernacle, picture of the tabernacle, the tabernacle is about Jesus Christ. Remember the scripture I gave you on last Sunday about if, if, if the scripture does not If, it does, if, if the scripture doesn't testify of Jesus, then it's not of him. So quit receiving stuff that's not the testimony of Jesus. The scripture testify of Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. From the beginning to right now, it's about Jesus. I gave you scriptures in Colossians chapter 2. Or Colossians chapter 1. Yeah, Colossians chapter 2. When he says that everything was created by me, everything was created for me, and anything that was created was not created unless it had to do with me. And that's just all of it in a nutshell. Everything is about Messiah, Jesus Christ. All right. So, so, so we understand that, that we have the gate, the entryway, and when you come through the gate, the first thing you see is the altar, the brazen altar. And I'm just going to go through this just so you can remember it. If you didn't write it down, just so you can remember it again. If you didn't remember it, you'll remember it now, hopefully. All right, so that's the reason I tell you you should take notes in church. You should have a private record in church. You should go to the YouTube. You should ask for a CD. You should do follow-up so you can grow in your faith. One time is not going to hit it for you. 
We're raising up people that's going to grow in their faith. If you're going to grow, you have to follow through. I mean, everybody don't like this type of language in church, but what, what are we doing then? If we're not growing, what are we doing? We're digressing, and we're continually being overtaken by the ways and the ideology of the world. Either you're moving forward or you're moving backwards. One or the other. Because there are times that we get infiltrated and we didn't get permission for infiltration. It's like that song, you, you hear these songs on TV and you walk around and you're singing them. You didn't plan on learning those songs. Like that Folger deal, it's a good time waking up, Folger's in your cup. Who sit down and try to remember that? You took time out and said, I'm going to remember that. It got in your spirit. They played it enough in you, and now you're able to sing and recite back to them what was played in you. I don't even know how I remember the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes, I said it enough. I know enough. I'm not even going there, but I guess I said it enough. And now I remember. Where did that come from? It must be in my spirit. I must have heard about the Pledge of Allegiance too much this past week. All right, so so we got the we got the altar. They will not get any of my attention today. We got the brazen altar. You have the CESPN if you want to hear that. All right, the brazen altar is a place that has, the altar has four horns on it. It has four horns on it. All right, we have uh, one, two, three, four. All right, the horns of the altar. All right, the first. Uh, I'm not going to even ask you if you know it because you know maybe you just didn't write it down, but. I'll just give it to you because I said I wasn't going to spend 30 minutes here. All right, the first horn represents forgiveness, right? Why? It's because when we meet Jesus Christ, we see Christ at the cross, we're seeking Christ out for forgiveness. We're seeking God out for forgiveness. You, you are forgiven for your sins at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, remember last week? When I first saw the light, you saw the light at the cross, all right? So that horn of the altar represents forgiveness, all right? And they have scripture for that. You can write it down. If you didn't write it down last week, I'll give it to you. I'm not going to read it, but I'll give you the scripture. Romans 3.25. Romans 3.25. The second horn of the altar represents deliverance from sin. It represents deliverance from sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Deliverance from sin. The third horn on the altar represents death of the old life. Death of the old life. Romans 6.6. 6. Romans 6.6. 6. Am I going too fast? Okay, well, you should have got it last week. I'm sorry. All right, <laughs> I was waiting to say that. I wasn't being mean. You know I love you, sister. All right. Boy, that was a setup right there. All right, number four, I'll give it to you. I'll give it. If you didn't, you know, I'm a nice pastor. You know, I'll give it to you. All right, all right, all right. All right, first scripture, forgiveness. Script, uh, first word, uh, first horn, forgiveness, Romans 3.25. Romans 3.25. Second horn, deliverance from sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. All right, third one, death of the old life. Uh, Romans 6, 6, you die there. Uh, the fourth horn represents we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, Romans 12, verse 1 through 2. All right, everybody got that? All right, if you, if you didn't get it, you just ask around in church and somebody got it. All right, all right, so dealing with the altar here. I'm going to deal with this and we're going to move on. Dealing with the altar here, the altar represent the cross. It represent where the blood was shed, my death, where I die. All right, we die at the altar. Right? You die at the altar. If you do not die at the altar, you'll never be able to live as a believer. If you do not die at the altar, you'll never be able to live as a believer. Romans 12 tells us that. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us that. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. All right? As a living sacrifice. You put sacrifices where? You put sacrifices on the altar. So you and I should live on the altar. Amen. All right. So let's deal with some. So, so the altar represents... A, a, a dedication of total death. At the altar, I die. At the altar, I trade in my life for the life of Jesus. Right? I trade in my life. I trade in my desires. See, this is the problem in the church is that we, we have allowed our desires and our ways to, to overshadow his desires for you. Because if we don't die, if we don't die at the altar, that means that our will is fighting against his will and you'll never, ever surrender to his will when your will want to do its thing. Your will die at the altar. If your will don't die at the altar, you become a self-will individual and you'll never walk in the fruitfulness of a true relationship with Christ is because it's all about you and not about Jesus. 
Matthew 5, 23. Please write this down because we need some deliverance going to take place right here at the altar. Matthew 5, verse 23. Once you get that, just say amen. Matthew 5, 23, verse 24. If you're there, just go ahead. Can you read it for me, please? Jeopardy, jeopardy. Okay, I got it. All right. No, she was ready. Go ahead. Oh, no, you weren't ready. All right, I got it. I'm back on track. Matthew 5, 23. In, in, in the uh, New Living Translation, it says, So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Verse 24 says, leave your sacrifice there at the altar and go be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. We have too many people in the body of Christ that are moving forward to present their gifts to God with a bunch of stuff that's undealt with. I got scripture to back it up. God didn't ask you to be perfect, but he asked you to be transparent and real. God never asked you and I to be perfect because he knows that's not possible. He's the only one that's perfect. But he wants us to come to him and say, God, here's my stuff. Here's my issues. And I want you to deal with these things in my life. So, so when we get involved in this whole understanding of temple worship, it's because every day you come, every time you come in the house of God, even though you might not look at it like the priest did ministry with the tabernacle, it's the same pattern. We come into God's house. We, meet, we met Jesus Christ at the gate. We get to the altar. We get to the place of repentance. We start dealing with our sin and start dealing with our issues so that we can get to the place and get into the holy place. That should be your desire, but a, not, a lot of us don't even get past the altar because we skip that whole process. And people say, oh, the Spirit of God was so strong today. And you would say, oh, 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 yeah. Come on, guys. You've been there at one point in your life. You might be there today. I don't know. But there are times that the power of God can be moving, and it's moving all around you, and you don't feel nothing. That's because you need to pin yourself. You need to take the cords and bind yourself to the altar. You bind yourself to the altar because you know that you need to be delivered. Hallelujah. So, so, so he says, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go be reconciled to people or to whoever you got an issue with. And then come and offer your sacrifice. People say, well, what if I, I, what if I can't do anything uh, with that person? You do your part. It's their job to do whatever they're going to do. Your job is to release and let go. Your job is to forgive because you, you'll be hung up with people because some people don't want peace. Some people don't want peace. Some people don't want harmony. Some people love confusion, man. Some people love drama. We, wanna, I need, to, we need to make a shirt say drama free, drama free. TJC, drama free. Boom, there it is. You got to come up with it, DJ. TJC, drama free. No drama. Say the drama for your mama. No, stop. All right. Anyway, we need to delete the drama. Delete the drama from your mama. Delete it from your daddy, too, because I'm not, I'm not getting into the gender thing. Everybody, male, female, everybody. All right, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. You know, somebody come out of me out the way and say, why you say your mama? Why you didn't say your daddy? Everybody. We cover everybody. Humanity. Humankind. All right. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, it says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So everybody that got their hammer and their nails out and ready to crucify everybody, remember you was guilty at one point in your life. But if the prison doors flow open, because guess what? When you appreciate grace, when you appreciate God's mercy, you'll, you'll be a more forgiving person. Because remember when you did what you did that nobody don't know but God what you did? Because you got some stuff on, come on. You, you got some stuff on your reservoir that if people knew some of the stuff you did, you will hide your face and never let anybody see you ever again. Because it's just that embarrassing. It's just that embarrassing. 
So, so be careful when you judge, lest the standards that you judge by come back and measure your house. Don't be a, don't, don't be a stone thrower. You know, Mary Magdalene, you know, she was guilty. Jesus knew she was guilty. Everybody else, probably the dudes that hooked up with her, they wanted to stone her. She's guilty. She's guilty. And Jesus said, okay, whichever one of you bad boys be, be without sin, you start throwing the stone first. And they walked away. And the girl was set free. It's because nobody had any ground to throw the stone. So quit throwing stones. Drop the rock. Write that one down. Drop the rock. Hallelujah. All right, all right. So, so we want to be a part of this reconciling process. So, so when, we come, when we come to the altar, the altar has to do with reconciliation. Because we die there. We are connected there. We've met Christ, and we come to the altar. Now we're reconciled to God because we present ourselves as a sacrifice at the altar. So, so if you're ever in a place of uh, 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 mayhem or whatever, and you come into the house of God, you need to already go through your confession processional. You, you, all, you start cleaning yourself before you get here. So I said, Lord, forgive me. I, I said the wrong thing to my husband, you know. And, and don't ask for forgiveness, and then you just ran off and left your husband or left your wife or whatever, and you just, just was mean to your dog, and you kick your dog to the corner. And, you know, you, you, it's great to forgive, but you need to try to be able to tell them you saw her. <laughs> Come on, guys. you never done that. You know, the dog, er, get back. you mad at everybody, so the dog get the wrath too, you know. It's just the truth. Is it true? So, so the deal is we want to make sure that we're reconciled with God so when we get into the presence of the Lord, we're coming into the presence of the Lord with a clear conscience. You know how I'm going to be here? Oh, Lord, help me, and Lord, bless this person, whatever, and your heart's so mad. You can't even pray for your spouse. You can't even pray for your children, but you can pray for everybody else. Be reconciled to God. It's like me coming here going to pray for all y'all, and I can't even pray for Pastor Sunder. I need, to, I need to know within myself is that all my prayers stopped up. Because if I can't take care of this right here, that means that I got a heart issue. I just need to just sit there and just be numb. You know? I've been mad at my wife before, you know, that I just I couldn't even think straight. I just sit there and just say, God, just sort me out because I already know I couldn't go any further. It has to be an understood in your heart. Don't deceive yourself like you can go farther because if you're moving forward, you're moving forward in what is called a lie. It's deception. If you're moving forward, you're really not moving forward. You're moving backwards because you've deceived yourself like it's okay. It's not okay. That's the reason I know it's not okay for me to go to sleep when I got issues with people. You know, I mean, Pastor Sims told us a couple weeks that every night you're getting ready for death anyway. You know, you're cleaning your spirit out. You're taking a nap every night. You're practicing every night. You're doing your rehearsal every night because we're all going to get out of here one day. Now, I plan on waking up here on this side. You know, the other side, great, but I got too much to do on this side. I'm not even ready to do that. All right. So we got the altar down. We got the altar down, right? Lay your stuff on the altar. Remember that song? Lay your sins on the altar, whatever that song. You got it, guys? We got to get to the altar because at the altar we can See, all this stuff, tabernacle, number one. When we, when we, when we deal with all this out of court stuff, all that's flesh, man. All, all this right here out here is flesh because you'll never get the true life without dealing with all this stuff. You'll never get there. And people say, well, well you know what? You really hadn't got there. You thought you got there, but you really hadn't got there. Because when you get there, you're going to come out glowing. When you get there, you're going you, you, you're gonna to be like touched by an angel. What's that girl's name when her hair used to turn red, that light came over? You know, touched by an angel. Y'all remember the show? It's like, <gasps> she even looked like an angel now. Even though she on the show, they marked her like that, that red light come over, you know. What's her name, y'all? All right, Exodus 30. Don't nobody want to tell me. Exodus 30. All right. All right, in Exodus 30. 30, verse 17 through 21. I'm going to read it straight out the Amplified. The Lord told Moses, he said, And the Lord said to Moses, You shall also make a laver or a large basin of bronze 
and its ba- its base of bronze for washing, and you shall put it outside in the court, outside in the court, between the tent of meeting and the altar of burnt offering, and you shall put water in it. There Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water that they die not. Boy, you, you, you got to remember this, y'all. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. It shall be a perpetual statue for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generation. Now, hold your spot there. I want you to turn over to Exodus 38, verse 8. Exodus 38, verse 8. In Exodus 38, verse 8, it says, The bronze wash basin and its bronze pedestal were cast from the solid bronze mirrors that were donated by the women who assembled, thank God for women, by the women who assembled at the entrance to the tabernacle. Well, I just got another revelation when I said thank God for women. Thank God. Amen. Hallelujah. So, so, so the deal is here. All right, we have, we, have, we have the bronze labor. All right, the bronze labor, you've heard the makeup of this whole bronze labor deal. The purpose, one of the purpose uh, of the bronze labor here, the Bible says that the priest was to wash his hands and his feet. All right? I want you to get in your head, hands and feet. Hands and feet, nose and toes. and Hands and feet, none of that. See, that's another song that just got in us, you know. Hands and feet. All right? Washing your hands represent your work. It represents your work. It represents what you've been doing. All right? It represents what you've been doing. I want you to just hold that in your mind. It represents what you have been doing. All right? He said, I want you to wash your feet. Your feet represent your walk. All right? Your walk with God. And so God is dealing with your work, and he's dealing with our walk. Your work and your walk. If your work is not produced by the Spirit, your work is useless. If your walk is not enabled by the Spirit, your walk is useless. The Bible tells us in the book of Philippians that any good works that come through you is produced by the Spirit of God. Because if it's you, it's called self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is not accepted to God. The Bible says in Isaiah that our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. So if our righteousness, which is self-righteousness, is as filthy rags before God, that means that I need the Lord's righteousness by His Spirit to flow through me so the righteousness that come through me can be accepted by Heavenly Father as a result in an understanding that is not by my own doing, but it's by the producing of the Spirit. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen right now, but it's okay. All right, so, so the water... The water here, it represents the process of continued sanctification, right? Sanctification is a continued process, right? When we deal with the concept of being born again, born again is a moment. I am born again in a moment. I meet Jesus in a moment. But when Paul told the church at Philippi, he said that every man has to work out his own salvation, not work for your salvation. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians that no man can work for his salvation lest he should boast. You can't Work is not going to get you saved. But work is a part of the sanctification process as God sanctify the physical individual. Right? For all you people that saved that thought you was just all together lovely, I don't want to bust your bubble today, because everybody in the earth is wrapped in sinful flesh. Everybody. Even the people that glow. You know? I mean, because you got people that's in the earth think just because they're Christians that they don't do anything. You're doing stuff when you don't know you're doing stuff. 
Because your flesh is not your buddy. It's not your friend. The Bible tells us in the book of Galatians is that there is a divine hatred between the flesh and the spirit. That's in the King James Version. It says the word, it says enmity, hatred. That's a divine hatred between what you're wrapped in and what you're wrapped in and who's really in here. Because the real you is not flesh. The real me is spirit. The real me is a spirit. I am a spirit that lives in a dirt body and I have a soul. That's who you are. And so the deal is here is that we need to understand that your flesh never works for you. We put flesh on the altar. And if flesh is not put on the altar, it will get out of control. That's the reason the Bible says we have to die daily. Don't die when you feel like dying because guess what? You'll never feel like dying. Not that type of death anyway. You know, you walk around and say, I just feel like killing my flesh today. Paul told the Romans, he said, modify your body. The word modify in the Greek means kill. He said, kill your flesh. Not commit suicide, but kill and buffet your flesh. Make your flesh obey. You say, I can't help myself. You're right. You need the Holy Ghost to help you. Because yourself ain't for you. I'm not speaking in riddles. I'm just telling the truth. And amen, you know, if you feel like you're on an island saying amen, I'll be there with you. So say amen. I'll say it with you. Ready? One, two, three. Amen. We did it together. You weren't by yourself. I was there with you. You know, I've been in places like that, man. I wanted to say amen, and it was so quiet or whatever. I had to just muffle my amen. Because, you know, my amen stood out, and they was like, oh, he think he all that. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, in Ephesians 5.15, and you, you can laugh. We're still holy. We're still in the spirit. You know, we're still there. Some of us need to laugh because the Bible says laughter does the heart uh, 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 good like medicine. And some of us, we don't laugh enough. Hallelujah. Ephesians 5.15. All right, it says in Ephesians 5.15, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. So you and I need to watch what we are doing. Not sometime, but all the time. Did, did you hear that? All right. Don't, don't have this. You know, we put on this uh, s- uh, selective clothing sometimes, you know. Sometimes we really Christian. Sometimes we like, you know, we like a superhero Christian. You know, we like, man, you just like spiritual genjutsu, everything, you know. We got the cape on. And then all of a sudden you don't feel as Christian as you, you know, you, you, you don't feel as, 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 as bubbly as you once felt. Guys, hear what the Spirit of God is trying to tell you. Watch how you walking. Watch how you living. Watch yourself. The King James Version said we should walk circumspectly before God. Because people watching you, they got their eyes on you. They say, well, why are they watching me? Well, they supposed to watch you. You know, the, the God of this world has put a scope on you. You being watched is because God has put the spotlight on you. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to you. Amen. All right. In John 17, 17, it says, Father, sanctify. And this is Jesus, and this is in the Aramaic. It says, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Because your word is truth. When somebody tells you the truth and you can't handle the truth, Jack Nicholson. Come on, you can't, you can't handle the truth. I'm still in the Spirit few good men. But we got a lot of few good men here. Amen. <laughs> All right. Listen. Listen, guys. Listen. When the truth is staring you down your nostrils and it's looking you in the eye and you don't want to convert, guess what we'll do? We will retreat and rebel. We call it flight. We'll take flight. I can't take it. I can't take it. You know, like O.J. Simpson in that, that Hurts commercial, you know. Just go don't run from God. Don't run from God. Adam ran from God. Anytime you're retreating from the truth, you need to start fighting against it. You need to say, it's the devil and my flesh that's pulling me away from what I know is true. I ain't going to church today because I just feel like the scum of the earth. It ain't God. It's your flesh. It's your flesh because it's no. You are just that close to your breakthrough. 
start feeling the heat of hell on your neck. You know, you start feeling, you start feeling just hot, you know. It's like, uh, you know, the devil tried to create all kind of situations to keep you away because guess what? You're in the chain station. You're in the chain zone. The heat comes when you're getting ready to change. When God is about to take you up, that's when pressure comes, guys. The truth will set you free. The truth will make you free. The truth that you know will make you free. But everybody don't want to know truth. Because that word know in the Greek means intimacy. It's almost that same word that when it said Adam knew Eve, same word. That you become one, you become intimate in such a way where the Holy Spirit can birth freedom in you. And everybody ain't going to be in agreement. Right now, I'm treading through all kind of, I feel like I'm just going, I'm navigating. Because there are so many stop signs that's trying to stop truth. But you can't stop truth. Truth will always win. I felt like breaking out in a rap then. Truth will always win. Because it'll go around you to hit the next person. You won't stop truth. The Bible tells us in Isaiah, it says that the word of God shall not return unto him void, but it shall accomplish that which he sent it out to do. Guess what, God? Don't go around me. Hit me with it, God. Knock me out with it, God. Hook me up, Jesus. Hook me up. So he says, I'm going to sanctify you. Meaning that the stuff that's in you that ain't right, the process of sanctification is getting it out of you. It's getting out of you. I mean, you ain't going to just sit there and all of a sudden have a truth moment. You know, just all of a sudden I got the truth. Let me tell you something. It is a continual bombardment of the Holy Spirit that's coming against your mind and coming against your flesh and coming against systematic thinking that's in the world today that's trying to convince you that you've embraced a lie and the lie you've embraced and, and, and counted that lie to be truth that it's all a lie anyway. Y'all know how we've embraced lies and we embraced it like it was the truth and the Lord and his cavalry had to come in by the Holy Ghost and to liberate you and I and let us know that the, what we believe wasn't true? Is that just me? Because I believed a lie before, but I embraced the lie like it was true. And when the Holy Spirit came in to set me free, I realized how deceived I was. Real people admit they stuff. You don't just run all over here. This ain't no Mario game. It's real life. It's real life. Deal with our issues so that we can walk in divine truth. You may say I'm a loving, not a fighter. You better learn how to fight now. You love God and fight right now. Hallelujah. Because some people don't like, see, I don't like all that. Well, you know what? When you were that kid on the playground, they come to take your lunch money. Either you're going to keep getting your lunch money taken or you're going to stand up and say, hey, today ain't the day. T today is not today. You know, if you would have came yesterday, it might have been a little different. But today is not today. You will get cut in the spirit today. That's the type of mindset that you have to develop. Because if we don't develop that type of mindset, you just a pushover. And the enemy will steamroll you. And even when you're standing up or you think you're standing up, you flat on your back. Get to the altar and get on your face. It says in Ephesians 5.25, he says, For the husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Verse 27 says, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Now, let me tell you something. Because I'm, I'm glad I got, I'm, I'm, I, can, I can just go ahead in the tabernacle teaching and I can just get this one in because I feel the Holy Ghost. Listen, how you expect people to be who they supposed to be in any relationship and all you do is berate them with words that are not of God. The Bible says that the husband who is Christ, 
His job is that he wash us, he sanctify us by the washing of the water of the word. So what type of words you speaking, did you heard? What you speaking? What you speaking? Because guess what? We create an issue by the words of our mouth. Whether you, whether you believe it or not, we have created power in our mouth. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 that the world that we see right now was framed by the spoken word of God. So you frame your children's world by your word. You frame your marriage by your word. You frame your life by your word. You got to watch what you're speaking. Watch what you're speaking. And then we want to turn around and blame everybody else. The Bible says we, can, we serve a good, good God. He's a good, good God. He's a good, good Father. And by the washing of the water of the Word, we are sanctified every day. So give me some encouragement, man. Encourage me. Get off of my back. I got enough hair on it already. Get off of my back. You got no room for nothing else. Get off my back. Get, get, off, get off me. Is anybody getting free right now? Hey, Amen. You, you ought to get ready to clap happy right now. It's because the deal is here is that we understand we have a God that loves us, so he speaks great words to us. Guess what? God's word don't always feel good. The Lord tell us sometime, and we just bust in tears, man. It's like, Jesus, just help me. Thank you for revelation. Thank you for deliverance. That's a good God. It's like I was talking to my wife, and I had to share something with her that, you know, I know that might have hurt her, but if I loved her, I had to share the truth with her. And afterwards, she looked at me and said, I thank you for that. Or afterwards, I look at her and I say, I appreciate you for that. It's going to take some submission to do that. Because some of us walk out like, okay, I, I'm free, you know. It's the sixes. I'm free. You got a limp. You know, I'm free. You got on shoes with fishes in the bottom. I'm free. But you know somebody help you got free? You know? Somebody help you got free? Come on, give a little appreciation, bro. Say thanks. Hey, appreciate that. I prayed it into fruition. Oh, you did? I fasted and it broke. Oh, you did? You forgot all the other components that God used to bring you to that place? Come on, get out of deception. You remember how, how much sleep I lost trying to pray you through? I was almost not to be your friend anymore. <laughs> uh, just tell the truth. You've had some people you was about to cut off. You was at the end of your rope. You was at that day. They don't need to call me anymore or more. You know? So you change your number. See, y'all laughing because it's the truth. It's like, that's it. That's it. I'm putting Facebook block on and who stopper and what stop. That's it. It's over. Who stopper? I had to pick up a stopper yesterday, so that stopper is in my spirit. I looked at so many stoppers, I can't help but to say stop. <laughs> Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, 22. We're we, we dealing with the lever, guys. I, I know, you know, we're all over the place right now, but we're dealing with the lever. Because some of us need to be lathered in the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 10, 22. It says, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts. Sincere hearts, somebody. Fully trust in him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Meaning that we've been baptized by the Spirit of God into his system. And his word is sanctifying us every day. Labor. If Sunday is your only place of sanctification in your mind, in your life, you in trouble. Because the priests would do their ministry daily. I heard that word floating around in here. Daily. Daily. Some of us, we just got a Sunday relationship. It's just Sunday. We don't pray. We don't pick up no Bible. We don't do nothing. We can tell everybody about everything else except what God's saying. Check out and see where you're putting your research at. Check out and see where you're putting your time at. Sanctification is daily. 
Self-inspection is daily. It's not every now and then. It's daily. It's daily. The priest did that ministry daily. So we come before the presence of the Lord, whether it's in this place, your place, at work, wherever, in the car, you got to go through the process of sanctification, washing your hands and washing your feet. You know, but what, what's so profound about this right here is that, that the Bible told, told us here over in, um, in Exodus 30 here, it says that the priests knew that they had to wash their hands and feet. It's because if they didn't, they would die. But you know what we do? We grab microphones, we grab everything, and we just we, we feel like we can do it, and we'll work it out while we're doing it. Let me tell you something. If you posture yourself before God like that, you're bringing judgment upon yourself. Hear what I'm saying? You're bringing judgment. You are bringing judgment upon yourself. It's because your gift is not welcomed by God. It's because you got stuff. Matthew 5, Matthew 5. It's not a contortment of the scripture. It's true. It said they was afraid. They washed before they took any sacrifice and put on the altar. They washed their hands and they washed their feet. Before they start dealing with anything, they got themselves ready. Are you getting yourself prepared to enter into the presence of the Lord? Are you getting yourself prepared to enter into the presence of the Lord? Are you calming your spirit? Are you watching yourself? Are you allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to invade you? Come on, somebody. Ask yourself right now. Are you really doing yourself due justice by doing what God say do? So I'm in the presence of the Lord. I feel the presence of the Lord. But you know what? Immediately, out of, immediately when we get out of that flesh moment, if it wasn't real presence, we go back to being mad at folk. If it wasn't a real presence, we go back looking. Some people, some people have the ability in the, in the body of Christ. I've seen it happen. They can come out of what they call the presence and look at their significant other or their children or look at you and can't even look at you straight. It's like, like, was that the presence of the Lord? You can verify we've had issues and problems or whatever. And, man, I, I'm on the altar. And it don't matter if I'm at fault or whatever. How many times I can call you on FaceTime laying on the altar? Because I can't get break. And we're not, we not putting our stuff on blast. I'm just telling. I understand. I can't get breakthrough. And I can't get into the presence of the Lord until whatever issue I got going on is, is, is fixed. I'm letting you into my house right now. I'm not here to just hold a microphone and go on whatever. I remember we were leaders years ago in Pastor Dudley's church. And, uh, man, we had an altercation. We were early married. And uh, I sit there, I said, we we not leaving this apartment. I know they waiting on us, but we not leaving this place until this issue resolved. I said, we're going to be real embarrassed because the richest ain't making the church today is because we we, we were leading prayer and, and all kind of stuff. And pastor didn't even know what was going on. I say, pastor, we, we ain't there yet because we sit, we, 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 we hammering out this issue right here. We supposed to be the leaders. I'm going to get up there and lead exaltation and lead everybody in prayer. And me and my wife can't even look at each other right. But many people in the body of Christ, they can go on to do whatever they want to do. Guess what? We take this office serious. That's the reason I minimize the traffic that come into my life, especially before I minister. I'm trying to get you to the understanding that if you're going to experience the presence of God, you got to be real with what you're doing. I'm not going to die with no microphone in my hand unless God just ready to take me out of here. I'm not going to die laying hands on you unless God just ready to take me out of here. It ain't going to be because I didn't repent. It ain't going to be because I didn't deal with my stuff. You know, you need to live deaf ready. That's what I want to hear. Guess what? Whenever your time to go, you need to have every issue you can resolved not waiting to get on no deathbed and have to beg everybody to forgive me. You know what? I'd ask everybody that I know right now if I've done anything wrong, please forgive me. We ain't letting no weeks and months and years go by. Let's, let's just deal with this stuff, man. I'm going to live another 50 years, but let's just, let's deal with it. I don't want, man, I don't want my blessings and my family hindered. I don't want my children hindered. I don't want you hindered. I got to preach to you. If my sink is stopped up, I can't get what God wants for you. I'm not just throwing you some little microwave meal. Some, somebody ought to just say amen. Thank you, Father. And we all need grace. 
Because nobody's perfect. But we need to do the best that we can, guys. We need to do the best that we can to have a spirit of holiness and truth and righteousness. Because we're dealing with holy things. We're dealing with holy things. James 1. I'm, 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 almost gonna, I'm just going to stop. James 1. If you're there, just say amen. If you're not there, just say I'm trying to get there. James 1, verse 21. I'm just going to go ahead and hit it, hit it just right here. James 1, verse 21. It says here in James 1, verse 21 in the uh, New Living Translation, says, So get rid of all your filth, evil in your lives, and humbly accept the word of God. G humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your soul. It said humbly accept, because the word of God has the power to save your soul. All right, now, I'm born again right now. I'm born again right now. Rapture took place, I'm with Jesus. You are too. Most of you, I hope everybody, you know, but I can't, I can't verify that. It's between you and the Lord. I just can say I got my ticket. All right, so this is the deal. As we understand that, I'm saved. Like, like Lynn and Raven Hill say, what are you saved from? Are you saved from lust? Are you saved from all this list of stuff? I'm born again, but I got stuff that the Word of God has to sanctify out of me. Every day is a day of sanctification. The Word of God is saving you and purging you every day. Every day. We have to live in an aggressive mode saying I got to get this stuff out of my life. I got to get the leaven out of my life. I got to get things that are not right out of my life. It's like cleaning your house. I got to get it out of my house. We want peace. People say they want peace, but they let everything that's unlike God stay in their life. You really don't want peace. Because when you want peace and you do it for peace's sake, you'll start moving the furniture around in your life. You'll start moving people around in your life. Because if you really want the peace of God, you'll begin to sacrifice for God so that you can get the true harvest. Say, we want peace. You don't even fast. And I'm not looking down on anybody because I hate fasting. I like the benefits of it, but I hate fasting. We say, I'm believing God for breakthrough in my family. Give up your meal. We, how you believe in God for, for certain breakthroughs? And, and a lot of people in the body of Christ don't even come to church. I'm not saying that to hit anybody. I'm just telling you, we got to get extreme. Guess what? There are some deliverances and there are some things that you want from God. It's going to happen because you went hard for God. It ain't going to happen just because say, Jesus, I love you. He said, I know you love me, but if you really want to free, be free, if you really want some deliverance, it's going to take some, some Isaac on the altar type of effort to get the deliverance you're looking for. Abraham, I know you love me, but I want to take a step further. I want your Isaac. I want what's dear to your heart. And when you give God what's dear to your heart, breakthrough is inevitable for you. Breakthrough will happen quicker than you ever thought that it would happen. Because now we understand desperate measures will always reduce great results. Like Bishop Judah says, always somewhere got to be a kickback. It has to be a kickback somewhere. You can't stay down forever. You can't stay down forever. James 1.23, he says, for, for if you listen to the word, please hear this. If you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in the mirror. The laver was made out of women's mirrors made out of women's mirrors and the women was at the entryway of the tabernacle thank god i said thank god for women because sometimes women can be used as a tool by god to help tweak your vision boy the women should have clapped for me then especially my wife her hands are tied up amen what's that guy named Pilate or Caiaphas one of them his wife said, hey, don't you bother that man. Don't have nothing to do with that. You know, I don't have good feelings about that. It's troubling me in my spirit. You better listen. You better listen. Amen. 
I'm behaving real good. So he says, he says it's going to be like looking in the mirror and you're going to forget your image. Verse 24 says you see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. You forget what you look like. Don't you know that we were created in the image and the likeness of Almighty God? And that the more and more you stay close to God and the more and more you allow the Word of God to infiltrate your spirit, my God, you begin to look at yourself like John G. Lake did, looked at himself in the mirror and say, the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. you got to start talking to yourself and say, no, this ain't going down like this. It ain't going down like this. Let's grab hands. Let's pray. Let's do what we need to do. We get some breakthrough here. Some breakthrough here. You know, if you're a radical like me, you can ask my wife. I'll just start screaming the blood, won't I? I'm telling you, my kids, they've been ready. They, they know daddy ain't crazy now. We'll have conflict, and I can't break that thing open. I'll just start saying, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. And all of a sudden, the whole atmosphere changed. I remember one incident. We was in a car, and that happened. Everything changed. And quickly, my wife, she, she, she did what she needed to do. Not that, I was at, not that I was like completely innocent, but I knew that the blood was going to be our rescue. I started screaming the blood because I knew that we was heading for a downhill spiral and the blood was the only thing that can turn it around. Oh, somebody better. I'm talking. You listening to a person that's walking in victory. I can say this because it's real. I'm walking in victory. I'm not giving you some false hope. This is how we live. We get into the presence of the Lord. We spend time with God. It's because you have to resort to the things of the Spirit. The flesh will always try to get a hold on you. And sometimes you just got to put a stop on it. You got to start praying in tongues, man. You got to, that's the reason everybody needs tongues. When you can't say nothing, let the Holy Spirit just pray through you. Let him just pray through you. Because now, God, I need a breakthrough. I need some things to shift. I need some things to change. It's not going to be done in your intellect. It's not going to be done in your physical ability. It's going to be a result of what the Spirit is changing right now. What the Spirit of God has done in you and through you. Verse 25 says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, if you do what it say, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. It says if you look into the perfect law, which is Christ, if you look into the face of Christ, which is the perfect law, and if you don't forget what you heard, the Bible says God will bless you for doing what you do. So Regus Richard has a right to walk around and declare Psalms 84, 11 because the Bible says when you do what God say, that God will not hold nothing back from you. It's because you've done what he say. You ought to be able to walk around and say, you know what, God, I'm doing what you said do. And once you've done the will of God, the Bible says you have need of patience because now we wait no manifestation. You can't wait on manifestation if you've not done the will of God. Anybody saying amen today? And I hope that's because you're in deep thought. Uh, I hope it's not because it's not the reality. If it's not your reality, let's get you there. You got to get to the place the way you have leverage with the big G. And you can come before God boldly. You can't come before the throne boldly if you've not allowed the Spirit of God to move through you to get His products or His uh, uh, way of doing things. Last scripture. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. It says, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know is now partial. It's incomplete. But then I will know everything completely. Just as God now knows me completely. We need to be washed daily in the word of God to cleanse ourselves. So that we can serve and minister before God. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 11, it's the famous prayer that Jesus Christ gave to the disciples. They say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. 
And one of the things they said, they said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, his way of doing things, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. You think it's talking about wonder bread? You think it's talking about Sara Lee? He's talking about spiritual bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And then he say, forgive us our debtors, those things that we are indebted to. Forgive us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. It's the word of God. We got to know that. We got to walk in that. It's not just some, 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 some prayer. It's more than just some prayer. We honor God. You're holy. You're holy. You're magnificent, God. Let your kingdom come in me. Not just in this world, in me. I'm the earth. Let your will be done in me. So today as we come to the conclusion of, of this part of this series, we meet Jesus Christ. He, he is the gate. We go from Jesus and we lay our life on the altar, Romans 12. We present ourselves as a living sacrifice, meaning that whatever God has prescribed for your life, you agree with it. But before you as a priest can take into the responsibility of the priesthood or ministry, uh, uh, the Bible says over in 1 Peter, it says that we are a royal priesthood. That we have all become priests. And through the veil of his flesh, by his blood, it has granted us access into the throne of God. But before we can do that, we need to deal with the issues that's within us. Deal with yourself. Don't walk around knowing that you messed up and not confronting your issues. You know if your attitude jacked up. You know if you got issues with everybody, you're pride, prideful, you're arrogant, you're looking down on people. You know how you are. You're not a person that forgives. You're not a person that loves. You don't show grace. You got to deal with you. You have to deal with you. It's amazing how we can go love the whole world and have compassion for everybody else. We don't love our own children. We don't love the people we live with. You say, oh, we do love you, but we really don't. Because love is action. We show people we love them. So the real truth is, is it real love that you're giving everybody else if you can't love your Jerusalem? Jerusalem is your house. Because people can look at you. You know what, if I, if I was somebody that, like, wasn't real Reagan, they'd be looking upside my head and say, boy, he a hypocrite. They'd be looking up at me saying, man, is that the same person preaching? Is the same person that we know? And I can be the biggest stumbling block in their life. I can be the biggest stumbling block. Because their, their, their relationship and their pitch of God is going to be somebody that was a pretender. And so most likely they'll grow up pretending in that same spirit. Do you want that for your children? Do you want that for your family? Well, change. Change. If it's for your kids, change. My kids know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a loud person. I inherited loud. My mama was a scream, and I was like, why are you screaming? It's like, Regus! It's like we live in a 1,200 square foot little building, you know, little house. Regus! Miss my mama. But I'm loud. But my children know, my family know that I'm not, I'm not some ratty dude. I'm not a person of confusion. That's not who I am. They know that. They know they can run to dad. They know they can run to mom. They run to me for everything. They run to mom too. She said they run to me when they, when they want other people to get in trouble. <laughs> so I can hear that call, dad, 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 dad. It's like trying to crank it up. But they run to me because love, too. You see how they, Samuel runs up into my arms and like I'm like trying to pull him off of me. It's like, dude, let me go. He's like, no, I, you know, no. 
because they know I love them and they know I care about them. Ain't that what I said? <laughs> they know I love them, but they know that I care about them. And they know I care about uh, the number one thing that my kids can tell you that I've been on them a whole lot about right now is what, Reagan? Huh? Not that. About what, what I've been asking God to do for y'all. I've been asking the Lord tirelessly. Lord, I said, I need my kids filled with the spirit. I say, every night y'all pray, Lord, fill, fill them with the spirit. Last night you would have you walked in uh, these boys' room and Samuel, man, you would have thought they was all preachers up in there. I said, Jesus, I love you. Use me, Jesus. You be hearing it on. Use me. I'm trying to get it in them. I'm trying to get them to the place to understand I want them to know God. And I want them to know the presence of the Lord. Guys, the greatest gift you can give somebody is to introduce them to Christ. To introduce them to Christ so that they can have a true, authentic experience for themselves. Let us stand, guys. Let us stand. You know, um, the goal of uh, what we're doing here is that um, that God is going to raise up a generation of people that's really in love with God. I had a lady ask me yesterday. She said, "She said, so what? Do, what do you see happening with the people at your church?" You know, she's like, "You know, what do you see? That's like what's happening." I said, "You know, I see a lot of family restoration. I see, I see a lot of healing. I see husband and wives and lives are being mended and things are happening." I said, "You know what?" The best thing that we could do is teach people not to be religious, but to be in a relationship to where nobody has to stand over them when it has to do with righteous living. That their conviction for God is the only thing they need. And so if I can ever impart anything to you, to your life, I want to impart the will to live, the spirit to fight. Not only fight to live, but to fight for the presence. That God would invade your homes. That you'll be able to invite the Lord in. Just invite him in. Invite him in. You can feel the presence of the Lord, you know. And your kids start looking around and everybody start looking around. And, and you know Jesus is in the building. Guys, life is too short in the natural to continue to live in conflict. Conflict with your significant other. Conflict with co-workers. Conflict with, with just the world. You can have more energy, more time, more peace by living in the pursuit of happiness from the Lord, the joy and the peace of the Holy Spirit, and the desire to share truth with all men. I pray in Jesus' name that the Spirit of God shall set upon you, that he'll set upon you, and that you'll begin to feel a tangible presence in such a way that your life is impacted for eternity. Because if one person is impacted, impact has the ability to flow to somebody else and be impacted. I ask the Lord all the time, I want to be impactful. I want my life to be so full of Christ that when I have encounters with people, that they have encounters with God because of the encounter that I've had with God. If you're not there yet, you need to start praying right now. God, do something to me. Change my countenance, Lord. Change my look, God. Change my response, God. Change me, Lord. Change me, Lord. You start asking him right now, change it. Change me. Look at yourself say, and say, Lord, I don't like the way that I am. I don't like the way things been. I want you to change me. You start seeing all those moments where you fly off the top and you lose it. You start asking God, change me. Lord, I know that's not the fruit of the Spirit. Change me. Change the way I deal with people, Lord. Change the way I approach people, Lord. Change me, Lord, because if you look like that to you, what do you look like to other people? Change me, Lord. Help me be an agent of love, a person of hope. I want to be a true hope dealer. I want people to look at me and they're going to recognize that I, when I step in the room, that hope comes in with me. When I step in the room, that life comes in with me. You want to bring the answers. You want to be the antidote, Christ through you, to help people. Find that peace. Give them the hope that marriage and love still exists. Give them the hope and the image that family values still exist. 
give them the hope and the image that brotherly love and commitment and loyalty and friendship still exists. Give them the hope that consistency of individual self-worth and dignity still exists. Don't be classified and numbered in the midst of those things that are inconsistent with the Word of God. Be one that's set out in the midst of the open and they know that you're different. You don't even have to work hard at it. Just yield. Just yield. Father, in Jesus' name, even as the Spirit of God is continually permeating my being, may you permeate the being of every person here. May you cause them, Lord God, to, to experience these waves of love, the intoxication of the fragrance of the King Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would change our ideology, God. That you would change the way that we view things, God. That you would change the way that we, that, that we judge things, God. That you would help us to be more forgiving. That you would help us to be more loving. That you would help us to be more peaceful. That we shall dismiss the spirit of chaos, the spirit of conflict and confusion, God. That we shall come into a place that we come in and we bring peace with us, God. That we come in, Lord, and if a fire gets started, it's because the fire of the Holy Ghost break out. But it shall not be a fire that exalt hell and destruction, God. We declare in Jesus' name that we shall be used as an agent to disarm the plans of the enemy. We declare in Jesus' name that when people see us that we shall really be the light of the world. That we shall really be the salt of the earth, God. Help us to be world changers for your name's sake and for your glory. Help us to turn the world upside down, God. Father, this joy that you've given unto us no man can take away. We declare the power of the Holy Spirit to flow, to flow, to flow, to flow through us, Lord, in a way that we've never known, in a way that we've never experienced, God. Let the glory be revealed. Let the glory be revealed in the name of Jesus, God. Lord God, that we can have such an impactful service that politicians can come in and be exposed to the presence and be convicted and compelled to change, God. Lord God, we know we all can be changed by your presence, God. In Jesus' name, come on, give him praise today. Come on, give him a hand clap. Come on, give him a hand clap. Give him a hand clap. We bless you. We bless you. The reason, this is the first time I ever say this because God just spoke it to me. The reason Isaac was able to give in hard times when it didn't look, look like he should have been given because he witnessed his father give him when nothing was there. What do you mean? Isaac walked up the hill to do sacrifice with his daddy with no sacrifice. And in his mind, he's wondering, how am I going to do sacrifice with my daddy and we don't have a sacrifice? So the spirit of sacrifice came upon Isaac while he was about to be sacrificed. So in the time of famine, Isaac didn't have a problem with sowing and sacrificing. It's because he had already experienced the results of a manifestation of a ram appearing when it wasn't nothing. So please help me remember this. The Holy Spirit helped me. God just spoke this to me right now. First time in my life. He showed me my son sitting right here. And the art of sacrifice is the result of exposure of those that sacrifice. This is all new. God want to use you. Every last one of us have an assignment. Every last one of us have an assignment. I don't know where your vineyard is. I don't know where the field that God is going to release you to plow in. To, to, to bring the harvest in. But I do know that you're hearing God is equipping every last one of you. God is equipping you. If I never knew nothing in my life, this is an equipping station for people to go out and change the world. Our job is to be a good, good father. He's the good, good father. But our job is to be good spiritual parents to release people into their destiny. That's our job. May the blessing of the Lord rest upon you. 
May the blessing of the Lord that rest upon you and add no sorrow. May you enjoy the blessing of his presence. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. We're going to have a time of prayer here. And if you need prayer, we got several people here that's going to pray for you at ministry.